created to entertain, educate, and evolve the modern day deer hunter. Yeah. Well, good deal, man. Let's jump into this. So, why don't you, uh, I'm glad we finally have the opportunity to, to do this. I know we've talked about doing it now for geez uh I've months right i mean it, it's been uh more than a couple months where we had looked at doing this and then you kind of foresaw to wait until this time because uh there was going to be a lot of information coming out and a lot of changes for rules and regulations for this upcoming deer season here in the state of michigan so if you wouldn't mind if you want to just do a uh somewhat brief introductory of yourself and uh you know, uh, why we're talking here today. Yeah, no. And I, again, appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about this stuff. There's, and especially have time devoted to talking to it. Like I said, it's, uh, so much of a, the conversation with most discussions is limited to like 30 seconds or two minutes. You can't really get into it a whole lot, but, um, yeah. So my, my name obviously is Chad Stewart. I'm the deer management specialist for the Michigan DNR. Um, a little bit of background is, uh, you know, we found CWD and free ranging deer in Michigan back in 2015. Um, seem to be doing pretty well with it in that initial area where we were finding it, but we found a pocket of positive animals last year and uh, really centered around that western Montcalm County area, and uh, it, it changed the it changed the strategy. It changed the discussion a little bit because we were finding so many of them, and uh, we spent a lot of time this year going into trying to figure out what regulations would look like to try to help address this. Trying to figure out what the strategy would be to try to limit the spread of it. Try to reduce the prevalence of the disease as much as possible. And, uh, yeah, there's obviously a lot of discussion on chronic wasting disease now in the state of Michigan because of uh, these these regulations. And it's really just one part of our overall strategy to try to eliminate it. But it's obviously one that concerns hunters a lot. So, yeah, um, it's a it's an important one. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, that's our primary audience. And that's why I wanted to have you on today. Um you know, I know that there's been a lot of talk, and, and maybe people are kind of sick of hearing uh, about CWD, and I hope that's not the case because uh, it's, it seems to be a growing problem and, uh, you know, a high-level concern. But I wanted to maybe, we'll, I think we'll cover it in a way today that uh, I haven't yet heard it been covered. And uh, one of the things I want to start ask, by asking you is it. In this scenario, I'm going to s- assume the answer to this question is no, but have have they fi- found any way to track down, like when you say a pocket kind of breaks out, do, do they do any um, like r- research to look and see if they can trace back potentially where an infected animal, where that this, uh, you know, like I guess we'll call it like an outbreak started? <laughs> So, yeah, we do, we do try that, um, and actually the first time we found CWD was in a highly suburban area. Sorry, I got a dog going. No, we should, we should clarify that, it w- I mean, we're both uh, the kind of people that are doing two things at once, and you're walking your dog while we're doing this, right? I've got, I've got, a, young, uh, I've got a young pointer going crazy and trying to burn some energy off before the evening, take a little pressure off my wife. So yeah, hopefully there won't be too many outbursts, but yeah. Multitasking. Um, it's nope. all good. Yeah, it absolutely is. So <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we, we did try to try to track down a little bit of what that first case when we found it, it was, uh, 
in Meridian Township in Ingham County. It was uh, what we would call a symptomatic deer. So she was a six-year-old doe, really skinny, um, acting acting very consistent with late stages of the disease. And, and in accordance with our response plan, animals that are like that, we test them. And lo and behold, that's the first animal that came up as a positive. Um, knowing the animal's location and where it was killed, we knew that there was a history there with uh, a carcass dump. So this animal was found in April, confirmed in May of 2015. Um, that previous winter, there was a report in one of the local newspapers about uh, a carcass dump that had been identified. I mean, it was, I think it was over 20 carcasses that were being dumped and just left into a field. Um, and that had kind of gotten resolved and got buried. So we actually exhumed some of those carcasses and found we actually got some test results back on some of those carcasses and look it, it didn't turn out to be anything and i guess we didn't necessarily expect it but we thought it was worthwhile testing them but sure. we do try to tr see if we can determine where the original source of the infection came from but it's really difficult yeah. because generally the first time you find cwd is not the first instance of cwd in that area so you're already behind behind the eight ball generally probably by a couple of years maybe in in general so i don't think too many states have been really successful in identifying the original source of the disease yeah i i mean just in knowing what i've known i've listened to uh geez i don't know if it's been 10 to 20 hours worth of podcasts that have been specific to cwd now and gotten some good in-depth good in-depth uh, what I would call scientific uh, information and then I've heard uh, a lot of what I'll call opinions as well and uh, I know you and I have maybe chatted a, a little bit of, about that but <clears throat> so far on the front here in our state ha has it been uh, is it kind of 50 50 with people that are fighting this thing and people that are accepting it or what, what would you say like the the general feeling of the you know the 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 hunting population is when we're talking about this topic here now and making plans to address it. Yeah. Um, it depends on the topic. Um, overall 50, 50, maybe a little bit generous in terms of overall support. You know, once you start breaking down actual pieces, I, I have yet to talk to any hunter who's a hundred percent in favor of everything that moved forward. Um, and I, I understand that. And to be honest with you, I could probably fit in that boat as well too. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's tough. There's, there are people that like certain aspects of a regulation change, people that hate certain aspects of the regulation change, but like other pieces and the other pieces, there's a lot of people that still are generally unaware of what CWD is or, or, or what the potential impacts could be or what it, what it even means. So, we've really got our work cut out for us and even just talking about the basics of the disease. And, and we've tried to do a good job at talking about that, whether it's through public meetings or social media or press releases, but you can only reach so many hunters and, and it still seems that there's a, a pretty large, large audience that we're still not, not reaching. Yeah. Well, I can imagine that the pace of life right now and the access to information that people have is is so great they really do have to choose like uh what they take in and what just kind of floats over their head and they may glance at an article on a you know a facebook post but they do nothing more than scroll right through it and they read the headline you know but uh to get somebody to commit five ten minutes to actually read an article it seems like a relatively small percentage of people that are you know w willing to do that yeah, you know, I, we've got some really good people in our communications department in the in the department, and they uh, they uh, they basically say if you're putting out content, it can't be more than about thirty or forty seconds. Um, otherwise, you're just going to lose people, or they're not going to click on it to to really right. understand it and yep. and to communicate something as complex and generally uncertain as CWD. It it just you just can't do it in thirty seconds, and that's why you know, really only the, the really hardcore hunters that 
that really consume and digest hours worth of podcasts or videos or read, you know, extensive articles are in the know of it. It's really hard to tap into that sort of weekend warrior hunter that um, obviously is really important to communicate with, but they just don't think about deer hunting 24 seven, 365, like a lot of other hunters that are probably downloading podcasts. Right. Yeah, well, I know uh, the general audience that listens to this podcast, and they listen to a, a lot of the same podcasts that I listen to. And like I said, there's been some real good in-depth talk, some science-based stuff uh, as of late, um, you know, that people have been able to listen to and digest. And then there's been opinions on both sides of the argument. So I figure it would be cool for me and you to sit down today and kind of maybe dig through a little bit of that, dissect that, and... Uh, I know you had just mentioned that you might not agree with anything, and I, I know you're a pretty level-headed guy, so I kind of figured you would be a good person to have a conversation with and fall maybe somewhere in the middle of the people that are you know, saying it's the end of the world and the people that are saying, hey, this is absolutely nothing. It's a farce. We need to pay no attention to that. I mean, to me, it seems from what I've taken in now, um, and the more and more I learn, the more and more I do grow concerned. And uh, this thing isn't going away. I mean, that's why the they seem to go to, and some people will call it extreme uh, levels with new regulations this season to try to at least detour this thing from growing, if that's something that we can even possibly do at this point. Yeah, and that's 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 the hope obviously right and i i know it really frustrates hunters when you know you've got a biologist talking about hopes and supposes and you know this suggests but um, with cwd there's really no absolutes and you know if someone's talking in terms of absolutes with this disease um i don't think that there's enough known about it yet certainly there's a lot more known about it today than there was 15 20 years ago but there's still there's still a lot left to be uh determined with it and if if i when i start hearing people talk about in terms of absolute on certain topics with this disease it generally tends to sensationalize that overall topic and honestly it happens on both sides like you said um you know there's the sky is falling group and there's the don't even bother with this this is a non-issue group um and I, it probably falls somewhere in the middle. You're, you're absolutely right. That's kind of refreshing to hear. One of the major things I guess I want to ask first, I mean, it, I, I've heard, um, you know, 100% fatality. It, I mean, is that, uh, you know, like a truthful fact? Do they do they know that, that every deer, because I had heard that there might be some deer that are less or more susceptible to it, but... Uh, can they verify that it is a hundred percent fatality for whitetails? So I'll, 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 I'll rephrase it. Um, there's, there's, there's no known recovery from CWD. So there's never been one documented case of an animal getting CWD and then recovering from the disease and basically saying, you know, oh, this, this, this animal's disease free now, you know, counter that with something like hemorrhagic disease, which we know, um, kills deer, we know it can be very what we call sort of acute in terms of how it affects deer and deer numbers. It can kill deer very rapidly within a matter of days to weeks. But some animals do recover from from that virus infection, and they're able to pass on immunity to surviving offspring. Um, we don't see that with CWD. So it's different than saying 100% of the deer are dying from CWD. That clearly is not the case because CWD is a chronic um, disease. It takes, on average, about 18 to 24 months to succumb to the disease. Um, some individuals can last longer. Um, I think in some cases it can go as long as three to five years. Um, and they are looking at potentially some sort of genetic I don't necessarily want to say resistance, but I don't, I don't personally have a better word for it at the moment, but they're able to live with it a little bit longer. Um, so there's, there's hope that there might be an evolutionary shift and it might mitigate the disease, but those animals still have the disease. If they live long enough, they can still succumb from the disease. 
And meanwhile, as they're living longer, they're still remaining infectious. So they're contributing to that environmental load and contamination at a longer rate than what normal animals would. So it's, it's, they call it a, a, from a veterinarian standpoint, it is a fatal disease and that you cannot recover from it Mm -hmm. and an animal can die from it, but not many animals ultimately do die from it. But the concern again is that as more and more animals become exposed at a younger age um, because of that environmental exposure, that they're not going to live as long. And once you get to about a year and a half to two years, they're going to die. And then that could ultimately affect the population dynamics of your year herd. Yeah, I would imagine that that would be an issue here in our state more so than other states because uh, I believe we have a pretty young uh, deer herd, right? Like uh, a lot of states have um, higher higher numbers of mature animals, and it, I think that's just a product of how many sportsmen go afield a, a year. Would I be accurate in saying that? Yeah, we've got obviously a lot of deer hunters in Michigan when you think of – I mean, obviously, Michigan is a, a reasonably large state, um, especially when you compare it with a lot of other Midwestern states. But we have just a lot of deer hunters. We've had, um, in recent years, as, as many as 600,000. I think we've dipped just a little bit below that. But Michigan uh, generally ranks about number two or three overall in the country in terms of whitetail deer harvest. Um, we're usually behind Texas, which makes complete sense. Texas is in a world of its own in terms of size and number of hunters in it. But generally we are number two. Um, sometimes we've dipped below Georgia, maybe Pennsylvania, but we're tops in the Midwest. So there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of history with deer hunting in Michigan. So there's a lot of pressure applied to, especially the males, um, the bucks. And uh, generally speaking, we had, we do have uh, uh, a higher uh, harvest rate on our, our yearling bucks, which, obviously has a cascading effects on the age structure of older bucks. Right. That seemed like that that from what I've heard and what I understand, um, bucks being more of the traveling animal and having the potential to spread the the disease a little faster and further, uh, with us, you know, taking as many bucks as we do. That seems like that might be something that was, or is in our favor for, you know, potentially controlling this thing well it's still uh, to be remain to be seen i guess um there are some published papers out there that have run through different models and and it does support a, a buck focused harvest strategy um and talking to some other biologists you know the question remains you know obviously those those yearling bucks do move around and move around at a higher rate we're starting to learn more about uh, doe movements as well, too, and, and especially dispersal. We do know that some does disperse as well, too, and generally speaking, they tend to go at longer distances. Um, they don't they don't disperse at, at the same rate as yearling bucks do, but they disperse at longer distances. And then when you factor in um, that CWD is probably a mix between a frequency and a density dependent disease. It's probably got a little bit of both going on with it and depending on what stage you're at, but regardless, the amount of times you're exposed to that pathogen, that prion, the more likely you are to pick up the disease. And when you think about a doe over the course of her life, um, she's generally hanging out with that same matriarchal group, you know, sisters, twins, um, daughters, um, mothers, aunts, um, and they, that group in Michigan is generally maybe between three and six, three and seven deer that you'll see. Mm -hmm. And if one of those animals has CWD, if they're living most of the year in close quarters, um, there's a really good chance that that one positive animal is going to spread it to another animal in that family group. Right. Yeah, I can see that. Um, you know, you and I were both at an event this past weekend, and uh, I got there just as you were finishing up, but uh, we were at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers uh, rendezvous here in the state of Michigan, and you had uh, come there to do a small presentation 
Um, it was based on CWD, I, I believe, in talking to you after that. I got there just as you were finishing up, correct? Correct, yeah. I think uh, I was just finishing up there, so you timed that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to... Uh, you know, what did I miss in that? Oh, I, There was a lot of people trying to grab your attention when that thing was over, and I didn't get a chance to kind of sit down with you, but... Um, I know that to be a pretty open-minded group of people, so I wondered if the conversation that you had with them was a, uh, in any way, shape, or form different than conversations that you've had at other events, and kind of if you could, you don't have to maybe go through the whole thing, but if you could kind of summarize to me what, what, you know, what you presented to them that I missed on Saturday. Yeah, well, most, most of what I talked about, um, Kevin, was, you know, the regulation changes, and and what they mean for the hunters. Um, and yeah, it's a very, uh, I found it to be a very open-minded group, a, a group that wants to be informed. Um, and that's certainly refreshing. Um, cause, uh, there's certainly, and I don't want to, I don't want to say this, uh, as, as a broad brushstroke amongst everyone, but there are certain individuals when you talk to them, it's very much closed minded and no matter what, uh, what information you provide them, there's, there's, there's resistance and that's I, I can understand that and really the point of the discussion with CWD is not to convince somebody that we're doing the right or wrong thing because ultimately there's so much uncertainty with it uh, we feel pretty strongly that this is an important issue and we need to try to address it early on as possible but uh, we understand too that there are sacrifices involved and some people don't like those sacrifices um, and and I, I wanted to really try to communicate why these decisions were made and what they hope to produce in terms of a response either with the deer herd or the disease and again um, not that i'm trying to get people to agree with us or our approach but just so they understand where we're coming from with it okay um that's perfect because that that's kind of the meat and potatoes of what i wanted to get into here today and I don't have the list sitting here in front of me, but I'm imagining you've covered it enough and talked about it enough. Um, are you comfortable kind of maybe going through that? Um, we don't have to be super detailed on every single one, but, um, you know, depending on how long it would take you to go through the whole thing in detail. But uh, I'd like to hear, you know, what the primary regulation changes are. I mean, obviously we have a broader audience than the state of Michigan here. But I think this is potentially, well, f certainly this is uh, a topic that deer hunters in other states are and have dealt with. And in the future, other people likely will be dealing with. So why did our state choose to do what they did? If you want to, you know, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. And, and to be fair, there's, there's maybe some there's a few novel approaches, but generally when you talk about what a state can do in terms of response, it's, it's fairly standard across the board. Okay. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of similarities in how states respond to this. Um, some states go a little bit further um, on certain topics. Some states do a little bit less. Um, and there's, there's several different extremes examples. So on, on one side of the scale, uh, I, I can probably point to a state like Wyoming, who historically has not really managed for CWD. And I, I, I feel comfortable saying that because I've heard uh, some staff in that department say that same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've seen, and, and certainly Wyoming is dealing with it on a much longer timeline, they've seen the disease spread. And um, they've seen some of those core areas where they first identified it prevalence to, to increase exponentially. So increasing at an increasing rate. Um, so doing nothing doesn't seem to be a reasonable approach when dealing with CWD. So we felt like we had to do something. Um, another extreme example would be Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin's a little bit different. They were the first Midwestern state to deal with it. And to their credit, they tried to eradicate the disease. They tried to get rid of it. Um, and the, the best way that they knew how to do it at the time was to get rid of the deer in that area that might have it. So the challenge with Wisconsin was they were behind the eight ball right away. Um, in that first year that they started looking for it, 
Uh, I think they found over 200 positive animals. So they were, it had been there for a while. And I think uh, they didn't know it at the time, but ultimately they had it and it had been there for a while and they weren't going to be able to get rid of it. So as they continued down that path and that approach, uh, ultimately it's, it, they weren't seeing the results from a disease standpoint that they wanted to. There was still disease in the landscape, drastically fewer animals um, as given the time frame that the disease was likely in place. And it, it eventually eroded public trust. And uh, that was one of the challenges. So we knew we didn't want to try to do that either. So that being said, we need to find some sort of middle ground. And that's where we started with. So we wanted to take a fairly comprehensive approach to it. And that incorporated um, trying to reduce or limit the introduction of disease into new areas mm -hmm. um, to stop the either stop the spread of it naturally occurring or to stop the artificial spread of it happening that's that's human induced and then we try we want to try to address the disease where it's known to exist and those are really the two prongs uh of our of our overall approach so from the introduction side um one of the things that we, we did was uh, bring forward a statewide restriction on which natural cervid urine based lures and attractants can be used. Mm -hmm. what so was, what was the exclusion on that? Yeah. Um, so this was one of the more unique approaches that we've done and it, it remains to be seen whether or not that this is going to be the, the appropriate approach or not. We'll, we'll see, but um, there was a program uh, that was recently adopted, I think a couple of years ago, and it was really sponsored by the Archery and Trade Association, the ATA. Mm -hmm. And they, they came forward with, in conjunction with the National Deer Alliance, and I believe there are some other players as well, to try to identify um, the facilities that produce this natural urine and highlight which, one, which, which facilities go above and beyond the federal standards. So most, uh, there, there's federal standards when it comes to captive deer. Sure. Um, they, they are regulated and these facilities have gone above and beyond. And this, and this program highlights those, those individual facilities that go above and beyond. Okay. And those, those facilities, um, they, they register somehow I, I, and they get this basically what's called a stamp. And they, they are now enrolled in this deer herd certification program. Um, they get this seal of participation. They've got like an ACA stamp on their bottles. And we use that as a threshold um, to try to highlight the, the, the producers of the facilities that are being very responsible in terms of testing, in terms of trying to uh, limit exposure from free ranging deer. Um, that are limiting movement in the facilities and outside of the facilities and basically doing a lot of testing and get rid of the facilities that produce urine that we don't know what they're doing. It's a very unregulated product for the most part. Right. Um, so we wanted to keep the good guys in business and um, keep sort of the, the guys that necessarily aren't being held up to the same standard out um, and there's more risk associated with it. And that's not to say that facilities that aren't enrolled in this program aren't good facilities. We know that there's some really good facilities that aren't enrolled in that program. Um, and they certainly may be eligible to be moved forward uh, in the future. But we, we, we created that threshold as uh, to try to limit the risk of, of spread or introduction into a new area. I gotcha. So essentially a tool to keep people from cutting corners and make sure everybody's following as strict of guidelines as possible, right? Well, we know we knew uh we knew uh, some some other groups had looked into this pretty pretty steeply and had sort of established that benchmark. So and we also know that 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 urine industry is really popular with hunters. We know that people use it as a cover scent, as an attractant. Um but there, we, we do feel that there is risk associated with it. Um, there are some peer-reviewed publications out there that do show infectivity um, of, of prions in urine. So we felt that that was important um, to consider as well. But we didn't want to go all in with it. So we felt this was a step in the right direction. And that's 
that's ultimately what we move forward with. I'd love to see people just personally get away from using lures in that manner. I mean, just what I've learned in the last year and a half of talking with uh, hunters that consistently, you know, what I'll, I'll call them, you know, the, the top tier of deer hunters, you know, the guys that go into areas year in, year out and kill bigger, mature deer um, versus what, you know, your you're, you're I, I don't want to call them weekend warriors because a lot of times that's all the time people have um, yeah. and they're looking for any little edge that they possibly can but universally none of the people that I look up to and respect would have any uh, you know any time for that in their strategies it would actually do the exact opposite it would harm how they you know how they hunt and i think more and more people are being educated on that and starting to hunt in that manner i mean i know the guys that i associate with certainly uh we're not leaning on products like that to try to be successful year in year out so i wonder just in general if people will move away from that or if that's just only because that's the group of people that i'm talking with but myself personally i made the move away from using lures like that just because i've seen my success rate go up yeah and it's it's obviously a very personal decision for a lot of people um you know some some people like to use it um some people believe that it works um you've obviously talked to a lot of hunters and formed your own opinion but uh, you know with cwd one of the things that comes up is you try to eliminate risk and we feel that there's risk associated with that. And as you keep removing things off the board and either planting on restrictions or um, taking away uh, privileges, um, it, it starts to pet, chip away at, you know, some of the things that hunters really love to do when they go out into the woods. So it's a fine balance between eliminating risk and, and keeping people engaged and, and interested in hunting when you start adding these little layers onto it. So it's really, it's really a challenge. Sure. I gather that. So, um, I'm glad that they at least went to that level on that. Um, what's the kind of the next major thing? I mean, is it, uh, I guess the numbers, right? Like, uh, zoning and numbers, what the harvests are going to be in extended seasons. Would that maybe be the next most popular thing to talk about? Yeah, we, uh, we, we brought forward a, a recommended management zone of, of 16 counties. And these are areas basically where we're going to be doing some heightened surveillance. So these are all counties where we've identified either CWD or our counties that are really adjacent to counties that have CWD and we, we consider high risk. And we just simply need additional surveillance in that area to understand if the disease exists there. So... Our, our, our main goal in creating this 16 county area is to get better confidence and understanding of where the disease exists. And of course we do have some regulations associated with, with, with those 16 county areas. So the big one that we're hearing a lot about now is in those 16 counties, we have an immediate ban on baiting and feeding. Um, Michigan allows baiting uh, and hunting over bait during the hunting season, uh, we've certainly limited it or restricted it in disease areas before. We've got four counties in the Northeast where we have bovine tuberculosis. It's been eliminated up there for several years, for quite a while actually. And in our core CWD era where we found it back in 2015, that was one of our responses as well. So that area has expanded now to include 16 counties. It kind of forms a belt um, from the Lake Michigan shoreline uh, all the way down into uh, the county that borders Ohio um, around the southwest region of southern Michigan. And then effective January 31st, uh, we've gone all in on a baiting and feeding ban in the entire lower peninsula. Um, and that's, that's certainly uh, getting a lot of pushback um, from a lot of hunters who rely on bait or like to hunt over bait to either improve their chances at, at shooting a deer or at least certainly see more deer when they're out hunting. I am beyond excited to watch and see. And I, I don't personally have anything against anybody that's baited. I've 
I've sh- shot plenty of deer over bait and it's a, a very effective strategy to harvest the deer in a short period of time. But I'm very interested to see what, how things will change with people's strategies. I mean, people that love to hunt, it seems like that's not going to be something that I personally, no one that I know, uh, and I can only speak for myself, no one that I know will be detoured from buying a tag or going out hunting this year probably as much as they have in the past uh, because there's no baiting. I would say from what I've heard, uh, it's been excitement to see how it potentially changes the hunting culture here. And it, it, is it something that, I mean, it's not set in stone for forever, right, that we're not going to be able to bait? It's... Um, or is it is that something hard to reverse if it if they don't think it has any type of impact on what they're trying to achieve by doing that? Yeah. So when you talk about regulations, nothing can really ever be set in stone. Um, if you recall, back in I think it was 2008 through about 2011, yes. uh, when we first found CWD in a captive facility in Michigan, um, you know our our response plan, our CWD response plan basically prohibited baiting and feeding it throughout that entire peninsula and that lasted for a couple of years and obviously it was resumed um you know the intent is to to move forward with it um and, and it doesn't have a it, that 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 regulation was brought forward without any sort of sunset clause or reevaluation period but that doesn't mean at some point in the future it, it won't get reevaluated and looked at um mm-hmm. the reason we brought that forward you know i think most people can understand why we're doing it immediately in areas where we have CWD uh, or are adjacent to areas that have CWD. Um, The reason we expanded it was simply because we know that the disease now exists at a much broader level in in, in southern Michigan and perhaps other parts of Michigan. Um, And we simply don't have the surveillance throughout the entirety of the state, especially the lower peninsula, to have confidence that it doesn't exist. And we do feel that it is an additive component on the landscape with animals coming um, frequently to bait sites. And that bait keeps getting replenished over time. Um, we know that deer shed prions in their saliva. We know that it's in their urine and in their feces. And when you constantly have bait on the ground, uh, whether it's from a pre-baiting standpoint to hunting over bait, um, we know that those animals are frequent frequenting it, and if one animal is infected, the likelihood of spreading the disease to another animal is greatly increased. And that's and that's not to say that it won't spread in the absence of a baiting and feeding ban. We know that deer are social animals. We know that there are resources on the landscape that will continue to concentrate deer, whether it's under an oak tree um, in the fall that's dropping a bunch of white 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 oak acorns um or uh an apple tree that's off in the woods that's dropping apples we know that that's going to exist but those are those are natural features of the environment and we can't affect that but we can affect one piece and that's the baiting piece that the the human side of it and that's why we move forward with it baiting includes mineral am i correct mineral correct yes salt blocks yes um and that is illegal to do here in our state uh was in the past illegal to do prior to what was the day is it's october 1st or september 15th i know there was a date when you could start correct yeah yeah gosh i'd have to go back and look look that up but there's a there's a feeding piece to it and then there's a there's an actual you know the baiting piece to it um so you can still um feed you could feed deer recreationally in in the southern part of michigan um if you're doing it within i think it was 100 yards of of your house so it's it's either recreational feeding or wildlife viewing whatever you wanted to call it um and that that obviously you can still feed wildlife so people still obviously like to feed birds um there's a lot of people that that feed turkeys in the northern part of michigan in the Mm -hmm. winter time um that's still going to be allowed we're just going to try to work with them to try to make it deer proof or deer resistant um which is difficult but um obviously it's it's pretty easy to tell when someone's in um intentionally 
baiting deer or feeding deer and someone's trying to do their best to feed another animal. Yeah, I've been somewhat shocked by the amount of uh, hunters that I follow here in our state and illegally do mineral sites all through the summer and are uh, don't hesitate to post it on social media and thousands of people see it and know that they're um, involved with illegal activity in, uh, in, in hunting. I, I'm just constantly shocked by it. Yeah, and, and a lot of people really rely on those minerals. Um, they feel that there's a lot of importance in terms of uh, rack development, um, you know, helping does recover through their, through their nursing period. Um, you know, a lot of that material um, is, is probably mostly salt and probably doesn't have a lot of impact. And certainly there are different products out there, and, and I, I don't want to, again, cast a broad brush stroke with a lot of these products because some of them, some people probably are seeing some results, um, but, but a lot of the products are really just salt based products and, and sure deer utilize them and, and, uh, and take advantage of it. But it, it really doesn't have a whole lot of impact nutritionally at the end of the day. Yeah. More so than anything, it's an attractant. I know guys like to do it cause they can get, you know, trail camera photos. Um, primarily that's why people are doing it in the, in the, you know, through the summer months, uh, I don't know how many guys truly believe that it does grow, you know, make the deer grow larger antlers or if any of that has or can be proven. But I do know that guys love it. And that's why I liked it is because you could concentrate deer in front of a game camera and get some really good photos and get a good idea of, you know, what general deer are in the area. But, you know, once I was made aware that, you know, it was illegal, I stopped doing it and I... I certainly wouldn't go post it on social media for thousands of people to see that I'm participating in illegal activity. And I'm constantly shocked by the people that are just careless about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, certainly I, when I was down in Indiana, I used to do the exact same thing when I had some property when doing ca trail camera surveys. And I, I love doing it, you know, just having a backpack and going in the woods and trying to get great pictures. And it helped me understand, you know, my harvest strategy going into the season, whether or not, um, the numbers I felt were up or down, or if there was a, a certain buck I wanted to focus on. And, and, uh, you know, since, since I've been up here and, and since we've been dealing with CWD, it's obviously not something that I, I'm going to engage in anymore. You know, I still love putting trail cameras out, but I'm more strategic in where I place them. So I try to find, you know, either pinch points or, or trails and, and try to orient my, my cameras that way instead. Um, and I, I certainly don't have nearly the level of success or the number of pictures that I've had in the past, but, uh, it still gets me to, to where I need to go and helps me understand what's out there. Um, albeit to a lesser extent. Right. And, and I'm certain that some people might may hear this, um, and have not known, I mean, in, in the past, you know, if you're going to read through the hunting guide every year, um, like we were just talking about earlier, you know, the attention span of most people is about 30 seconds these days. So <laughs> to think that someone's going to sit down and read the hunter's digest for this year, front to back, I'm sure there's some people that don't even know what they're doing is illegal, but it has been illegal. And now there will probably be more an emphasis on it because of, uh, you know, the new baiting regulations that it, it's going to have a little lower tolerance, I would assume, for people doing things like that. Yeah, and that's that's one of the key things when we, we've been talking with, with people is, you know, when you have a new regulation change like this, you know, try to stay informed. You know, just don't assume that what used to be will continue to be the next year. At least at least do your homework. And we try to highlight all of that information generally on the cover of, a, of our honey and trapping digest to try to get people at least interest but yeah it's hard it's a big thick document i mean we not only have the hunting and trapping digest but we have our analyst digest as well and now we're asking deer hunters to basically read read through two different booklets and it's it's a lot admittedly yeah what is the protocol uh for someone that wants to report an illegal mineral site or uh illegal bait pile now would that just be the wrap line yeah, yeah. We've got, a, like you said, a wrap line. Um, that's the best way to do it. Um, it just, just, it's a 24-hour manned uh, hotline. Any sort of game violation or any issue with wildlife that you see, that's, that's the best uh, toll-free number to call, absolutely. Okay. 
Um, so baiting, now that's the, the lower, right? Uh, that's excluding the UP. So as to this point, they're going to allow baiting in the UP? Correct. Yeah, we've not identified CWD anywhere in the UP. Um, that's obviously a, a good thing. Um, that being said, there obviously is concern because the UP shares a, a border with Wisconsin. And, you know, the more Wisconsin continues to look in the northern parts of their state, the more and more animals they tend to find. Uh, they're finding some captive deer facilities up there. They're finding some positive free-ranging deer up there. Um so it's, it's probably not a matter of, of if, but when they find CWD in the UP. Um, and then we'll certainly um, make considerations for abating, for abating and feeding at that point and see what it looks like. But generally, when we start with such a dramatic approach, we want to try to get an understanding with what's going on in that area first. So, um, you know, the baiting and feeding ban... We've been doing this now for three years, um, and we're just getting to that point now. So b prior to that, it was much more of a localized impact because we know, again, that's one of those pieces that some hunters really love to do. And, and certainly as you get up into the upper peninsula of Michigan, that becomes more of a common practice than uh, elsewhere in the lower peninsula. Right. Yeah. Lower deer density and a lot of ground to cover, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Not nearly as much pressure, um, completely different landscape here with, with some exceptions in that South central part of the UP, um, which is, which is still pretty agricultural, a um, lot of big woods, open woods. And, you know, it, you've really, you've got to really be a, a really skilled hunter to be successful up there year in and year out in, in wide open terrain and low deer densities. And, and some people can do it, um, other people, it's a little bit more of a challenge. I wonder if we'll see a uh, uptick in people traveling to the UP this year to deer hunt with uh, being able to, you know, if baiting is their traditional approach and method and they're on limited time, I wonder if more people will uh, commit to the drive and, and go up to the UP and, and deer hunt up there. And uh, that would be kind of neat. You know, it's crazy. I've been deer hunting now for 20 some years. I've never deer hunted in the UP. And the reason is the drive. And uh, people have been asking me, hey, you know, are you going to do any out of state hunting this year? And my answer is no, I've got a lot going on. And then they say, well, next year, do you want to do any out of state hunting? Maybe go on a whitetail hunt or an elk hunt. And I next year what I want to do is go to the UP and hunt which seems like an out-of-state hunt for me because I've never had the opportunity to do it plus I've been enjoying more getting out into the open spaces and just getting away from like the back 40 hunting so I'm kind of really looking forward to getting up to up there for that reason but I'm wondering if people because they will be allowed to bait up there they will see an uptick of people coming across the bridge to deer hunt this season. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting, and, and we'll have to see that. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll be able to measure a direct cause-effect relationship. You know, three years ago, that, that UP deer herd got hit really hard with, with some a string of severe winters, and the numbers, the numbers really suffered. And the participation, I think, suffered up there as well um, because people just weren't making that trip anymore um, because the UP is – is reliant on some lower peninsula deer hunters going up and, and certainly it's changed over time most of our deer harvested um, back in the 50s was were taken out of the up and that's obviously shifted dramatically to where today most of the deer are being taken from the southern lower peninsula um, due to the maturation of the forest up there due to the um, high agricultural uh, landscape in uh, southern michigan but uh, that deer herd over the past couple of years has been recovering. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that trend sort of emerges and, and whether or not we'll be able to tease that out because now people can bait and they, they, they prefer to hunt over bait or if it's just sort of the return to more respectable deer numbers than what it was in the previous two or three years. So, uh, and I know I asked you this Saturday, but the, the measurable harvest from last year or what, what, I don't know what data the state would be going off of, but the deer numbers are um, going in the right direction up there? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, uh, we've been seeing an increase in our deer harvest in, in a lot of places, and we were up, we were up uh, over 10%, I believe, um, last year. God, I've been so busy with the CWD stuff. I've, I've got to look over the numbers a little bit better. But the UP saw a, a tremendous rebound. 
Um, so perfect example, we, we liberalized some antlerless quotas up in the UP uh, this year. And a couple of those South Central DMUs um, and, and the trends that we looked at in terms of antler, antler harvest, we've seen in some cases a 50% increase in antlered harvest or buck harvest um, in just about a three-year period. So we've seen pretty dramatic swings occurring up in the UP in terms of recovery. Um, certainly, I think there's a ways to go in some places. Um, I don't want to, again, each, each part of the UP is a little bit differently, but in general, we're seeing uh, some better deer numbers in, in recent years up in the UP. And I'm expecting that trend to continue again this year. Yeah, I hope again, I and I hope we have another mild winter just strictly for that reason. Uh, it's it's exciting to see that come come back and you hear about the old past traditions of UP deer camps. And uh, I think for my generation, one that just like touching on earlier, pace of life and the time and availability that people have. Um, but also it seems nowadays when people want to travel to deer hunt, it's usually in search of one thing and that's bigger antlers. And that's, you know, I know there's guys in the UP that are consistently killing big, mature, nice bucks year in, year out. You know, they've been doing it for years. They have their strategies and their places uh, dialed in. And I'm sure with the expanse of landscape up there that there's mature deer that uh, die from, you know, natural causes and an old age, but it, it would be cool to see, you know, like a, a younger demographic maybe bounce back to some of that, you know, traditional, traditional deer camp and heading up in the UP seems like a great spot to pursue that. Yeah, absolutely. When you talk about age structure in your buck population, some of the, some of the best parts in the state, uh, when you talk about proportion of older bucks in the landscape, are parts of the UP. And for the reasons you just described, that there's just less pressure up there. And once a buck gets to be about a little over a year and a half, two and a half years old, their ability to sort of withstand even a severe winter is increased. You know, that, that really takes effect on those fawns and, and some of those younger, skinnier deer. But once you get a bigger buck with a little bit more body mass, they can, they've been through it before and they can, they can survive uh, generally at a little bit higher rate. So you get a little bit more age on them and then you can get some fantastic deer coming out of uh, the UP. I know, uh, I think that Keweenaw Peninsula always does really well in terms of some of the, some of the nicer deer that come out of there. I'm so excited about that. Just my evolutionary process as a deer hunter and what I've been gravitating towards in the last couple of years is the bigger tracks of forest and I've been enjoying backpacking and camping and boy, I, I, I'm really looking forward to getting up to the UP and just open up my map and just, just going and knowing that I'm not going to be constantly running into people and see some beautiful landscapes and yeah, man, I, I can't wait to hear the first footsteps of a deer coming through some crunchy leaves knowing that I'm up in the upper peninsula and I've never done it before. So, Yeah, when most people talk about going out of state, um, they're really just looking for a different experience than what they're used to. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine a, a, a more different place. If you're, if you're a southern Michigan hunter, you know, sort of a agricultural belt, farmland kind of deer hunter, then going up north into the UP and you're starting to pick up a lot more aspen and birch and, and spruce and hemlock. And you've got a whole different suite of little birds around you and, and small mammals maybe running around that you might be able to see. And so it's, it's, it's a really neat experience. I, I, <laughs> I'm excited for you. Off the topic of CWD for a second, but staying with the UP, um, how is everybody doing with the, you know, what's the, the general outlook on the, the wolf population up there? Or is it like a confirmed science-based fact that that's having an effect on deer numbers? Or is that just an opinion? I'm, I'm really, really uninformed on what the situation is with wolf numbers and the population in the UP and what effect that is potentially having on the deer herd. Yeah, and, and you know, to be fair, I'm I'm not the best person to be talking about trends with wolves or okay. uh, even even overall impacts with it with uh, within the DNR. We've got we've got a, a, a wolf biologist. Uh, we've got some researchers that are specifically looking at that. Um, overall, obviously, look. I mean, we know that wolves have been eating deer for 
tens of thousands of years. Uh, we know that that happens. And absolutely. Um, really, when you talk about the driving force up there, it's really those severe winters. And that's not to say that wolves or coyotes or even to a lesser extent bears, especially uh, during the fawning season, can't have some sort of impact. So that that can be observed, absolutely. And I know people want to talk about that. But really, when you talk about overall numbers, overall impacts on the deer herd, it's, it's going to be those severe winters. Okay. Um, we've lost... Uh, going back, and I, I think it's about 2014 and 15, I believe it was, or 2013 and 14, we had some studies up there on some collared fawns, and virtually none of them survived those winters. It was really, um, really rough for those guys, and uh, we, we saw very, very little recruitment, and it takes a long time for those low numbers to work their way through an entire through an entire uh, deer population so you've got absences in numbers once you get two and a half years out three and a half years out those those animals that were born back at that time frame just simply are non-existent or in, in very low numbers mm. it takes a long time to, to work through that and that's that's largely driven by by weather by winter yeah it makes sense and i think i had heard of uh a statistic not here to Michigan, but somewhere that had real high bear densities that black bears were actually a greater impact on uh, young deer numbers than what wolves were in some some areas. Uh, I can't remember where I had heard that, but I was kind of surprised by that. And uh, f from what I do remember, it was a science-based fact that, yeah, during the fawning season, uh, I guess uh, the bears are pretty easy pickings for them and uh that they can do more devastation to uh young deer than what wolves even were doing yeah obviously you know bears are fairly opportunistic and you know their whole sole purpose during the summer is to is to put on pounds and there's there's not too many things out in the woods that are better than a, a small six or eight pound fawn that's just full of protein um so if they come across it absolutely they're going to they're going to chow down on it. So we've got some, we've got some really cool research going on up there. Um, it's, uh, if anybody's interested in just sort of do an internet search on uh, Michigan predator prey project, we've been doing that for several years now. There's some really interesting facts. Um, I really, actually, if you want to talk and really dive into that topic a little bit more, I, I can give you a name of someone um, to talk about that. I think it would be fascinating to talk about I, the absolutely. research and stuff that they've come out of. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get that from you because I absolutely would would like to have that conversation. Um, you know, the other stuff I, I obviously is pretty self-explanatory for the most part, right? I mean, increased limits, longer seasons. Uh, I think everybody understands the reasoning for that. Am I? Am I is there any large scale things that I'm missing? So, yeah, so I think the one thing that is often misinterpreted and, and a lot of people think linearly in terms of opportunity, whether it's number of licenses available or, or season length, and they think that those extra days, again, translates uh, to increased harvest at the same rate that what you see previously, and it doesn't really work that way. So, you know, when you say something that's linear, you're thinking of a straight line. And really what it is is more of like what's called a logistic growth. So what it is is it, it increases to a certain point, and then it still continues to increase, but it increases at a decreasing rate. So it kind of plateaus. So what's, what that means is you get diminishing returns over time with more and more things that you add. So it might be additive, but it's minimally additive. And when, you, when people see that there's a new antlerless season or there's more opportunities to purchase antlerless licenses, it, the jump in logic tends to be, oh my gosh, we're going to really decimate the deer herd. And really what it amounts to is just additional opportunity with a few extra animals being harvested. And that's really what we're expecting. So we're not expecting a complete decimation of the deer herd by having these regulation changes. Yeah. Um, so that's a that's an interesting point. Only, only about uh, so perfect example. Um, deer hunters in the 16 county area will be able to purchase 10 antlerless licenses. 
Um, and people think that and uh, equate the opportunity to purchase 10 antlerless licenses with harvesting 10 antlerless deer. And I don't know anybody that harvests 10 deer. Um, right. It just doesn't happen. In fact, only 35% of our deer hunters in Michigan even purchase an antlerless license. And those that do, I think it's only 3 or 4% are purchasing more than 3. That's uh, crazy. Or, th- or, th- or, or 3 or more. So a lot of these changes in, are somewhat superficial in nature, um, but it does provide some opportunity and limits uh, eliminates some of those restrictions to those hunters who, albeit there are a few of them out there that do it, want to kill a few more deer and want to harvest a few more deer. Um, they can now do that without any sort of hurdles to get through, and I think that's really important. Yeah, that's that, that's a nutty number for me. I, I so look forward every year to having you know, a couple doe tags in my pocket and hopefully being able to fill them. Cause to me, that's opportunity and time for me to be, be a field. And, uh, it takes a little pressure off of me to, you know, potentially, uh, pass a year and a half old, old buck just for the specific reason of filling the freezer when I have, and know that I have, uh, you know, a couple doe tags in my pocket. So I, I'm just surprised that more people don't take, take that opportunity because, you know, I talk with guys all around the country and you talk to guys out West and they can't even get an antlerless tag. Their, you know, their numbers are suffering so greatly and they're, they can get one license a year and they have to choose ahead of time if they want to do it with archery equipment and firearms. And man, it, it really made me come to a personal realization of just how fortunate we are here in this state and how much opportunity we do have. And it, it kind of changed the way I look at hunting at a local level and just in general and uh really made me more appreciative of what we have here at our fingertips yeah you know it's uh we're we're really really fortunate to be hunting in the state that we do that has obviously a lot of deer a lot of good numbers and and a lot of landscape for them to sort of spread out on and and there are very few places where we're limited in our opportunity to harvest deer. Um, like you said, a lot of people in, in some of those Western states have to draw just to be eligible to hunt certain species. Um, we don't have to do that in Michigan, fortunately. And I think that's one of the key pieces with CWD. And I, again, I don't want to go too far onto the doomsday side because we don't know, but there is some concern that over time, CWD can start having population level impacts on deer. And ultimately that's what we're trying to prevent. So we're trying to be really precautionary um, with our regulations and our approach to this disease, because we want to make sure that those opportunities are available for, for future generations. Um, not saying that the disease in any way, shape or form is going to eliminate, extirpate whatever the white tailed deer, but could it compromise their overall herd growth? Um, it's possible. Um, I think there's some support from some other states that have seen that, and we don't want to be one of those states. Yeah. Well, I'm willing to, you know, trust in what you guys are doing and follow suit because I'm concerned as well, and I want to see my son have the same opportunities that, you know, that I had and potentially more. So anything that I can do to protect that for myself and future generations uh i'm going to be on board with and i'm I'm glad we have good people here in our state that i feel like are you know really going above and beyond and doing their job and you're yourself included i i know you you hold a lot of this real you know at a personal level and it's a great concern of yours and uh it, it is frustrating to me when i hear people that um and, you know, I have good close friends that are very strong in their opinion that this is all political based and uh, it's all garbage and there's no facts. Um, you know, I kind of fall a little bit on the other sideline. I mean, I, I, I respect that opinion and I'm always open eared and I think everyone should approach everything with skepticism nowadays because uh, and, and I understand why people don't trust a lot of what they read and see i mean you read some of these magazine articles and the things that they talk about literally someone will some journalist will write a three-page lie 
<laughs> essentially that's a, a story that they're trying to get a point across that none of it is actually factual and so I can see why everyone is you know very hesitant to to trust anything do you feel like we do a good job here in our state of basing our decisions uh, on science versus political interest I mean you keep hearing the thing car crashes and insurance companies and I can't believe for a second that that has any any basis on what we're doing here with uh you know our, our rules and regulations yeah no i think we i think we do a good job trying to stay with the science um and the challenge is that the science is ever evolving um especially with cwd um yeah I, so i've i've been managing deer now at a state level for over 12 years um across two different states and I've, i can honestly say i've never had a conversation with an insurance agent <laughs> it just doesn't exist it's a it's a non-issue that's one of those old wives tales that's still out there right um it's it's i can understand and i agree with your point that every everybody needs to approach almost every topic with a degree of skepticism because there are so many talking points with cwd and i would say context is really important when you listen to what those talking points are and it's very easy to frame an argument on one side or another based on how you want that impression to be held um and i'll try and give you an example and i gave that this example at uh at the event this weekend so a lot of people talk about this south converse mule deer herd in wyoming and one there, there's a factual statement would be uh that that deer herd has declined by 50% over the past decade, all the while having over 50% or over 40%, excuse me, prevalence rate in that deer herd. So if you hear that statistic and that fact, it's pretty easy to think that, oh my gosh, CWD, when you get to really high levels, has a pretty catastrophic impact on the deer herd. When another, another talking point in that same mule deer herd is that despite having 40 percent prevalence rate in that deer herd uh that deer herd has recovered by about 50 percent over the past i think it's three or four years so if you just hear that statistic separately you think that cwd is not a big deal because here's a deer herd that has it at 40 percent literally two out of every five animals is affected with the disease and yet the herd's growing but it's still a factual statement. Right. So what really is going on there is that absolutely that deer herd has declined over the past decade. And when you talk to the veterinarian or the biologist or researchers out there, part of that decline is absolutely attributed to chronic wasting disease. The problem is that there's other factors associated with it as well. They've I've also have had severe winters, range development um there's several things going on out there in that little unit of wyoming and over the past couple years some of those external factors have been mitigated some so you're starting to see a little bit of recovery so the herd is growing they're at a younger age structure because some of these animals just aren't living long enough so cwd is still having an impact but overall you are seeing growth in the in the recent recent history but over the long term that herd has declined but if you if you hear two different facts which are both true it can lead you one way or the other in terms of your beliefs sure. and that's something that we need to kind of get away from we need to we need to paint the entire picture so people have a more clear understanding of what's going on instead of focusing on the extremes and trying to convince people to follow a certain belief or, or dogma boy and i think that is uh we could say that just in general <laughs> with everything right i mean outside yeah. of cwd that that is kind of a good way to approach your day-to-day -day life yeah there's a lot of parallels in uh just your <laughs> your everyday life that that can probably apply to but you know i i eat sleep and breathe deer and, and probably probably differently than what you do i mean obviously you talk with a lot of experts from hunting i don't claim to be a good hunter at all but I, I i try to consume as much information as i can from a management standpoint 
Um, so when I hear those tidbits and see what the differences are and can dive a little bit deeper, um, it's important to try to highlight those differences because not everybody can have the time to sort of tease that out. They're, they're, they're left with sound bites from one side or the other. And, uh, that, that, that sound bite can actually hold an influence in how you, uh, ultimately perceive this disease when if you hear the entire picture it might change your perspective so chad i guess the we'll get finished up here uh i guess two things i want i want to finish with here um one would be um it's not all doom and gloom here right i, I mean right now in our state and you said harvest numbers are up um Deer hunting right now at this time in Michigan is, is it arguably as good as it's ever been in history? I mean, it, it, it seems like our, our numbers are phenomenal right now. We have good hunter engagement, uh, youth. I see constantly more like youth programs going on, like in general, um, are, are things looking pretty good here in our state as of now? Um, and this is something that we need to be paying attention to, but literally everything's not going to burn to the ground in a year, right? No, no, not at all. Especially with chronic wasting disease. You, you, in many cases, you're not going to see an impact with chronic wasting disease, potentially even in your lifetime. Um, you know, it's, if you let it go, maybe in, you know, 10 years, 15 years, you'll really start seeing the changes on the landscape. But, um, yeah, I think, and, and there are, there are probably thousands, if not tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of hunters out there that will disagree with me, but it's not, it's not the worst time to be a hunter in Michigan. You know, we've got, certainly we don't have near, we're, we're never going to experience record harvests again. Um, at one point we were over 500,000 animals harvested. We're not even close to that. And we shouldn't be. We shouldn't get back to those numbers. So the numbers of deer that are being killed um, will never be a record number. But that being said, we were killing 70, 75% yearling bucks in our, in our buck harvest back then. That number is much, much lower now. Um, some of that is being done from a regulatory standpoint. Some of that's being done from a voluntary standpoint. So hunters are naturally shifting and, and preferring to harvest um you know, older bucks. Um, I think where Michigan still is needs improvement is we still need to increase our, our antlerless harvest. And that, that I think will more further adopt more of a, a quality kind of management approach and, and balancing out your sex ratios a little bit better. We're, we're really behind in that, um, more so than certainly a lot of other Midwestern states. So looking at the data from those 16 counties in the CWD management zone, Nearly every one of those counties um, over the past five years harvested on average more antler deer than antlerless deer. In some cases, up to 25% more. And that's a gap that I feel like we need to close. And it won't take much to close that gap. Um, really, only about one to two antlerless deer per square mile in a county will help bridge that gap and balance out those numbers a little bit more. And I think that will further increase the overall experience yeah well i can assure uh fellow hunters and the state that i will be doing my part to uh increase doe harvest because man i'm not kidding that's something i look forward to every year it's kind of funny i found myself this season getting trail camera photos and looking at a doe and not just looking at it as a deer without antlers like looking at it and being like "Ooh, that's like a four or a five year old doe that's a nice big old doe you know like i know when i'm out this season i'm going to be conscious that she's in the area and that'll be a like a target animal for me so i'm really probably more excited than most people are i guess this year to harvest some does yeah when you think about the overall challenge of getting in close in bow range to a old mature doe um there's there's little bit that can be uh, exciting about that you know forget take the antler equation off the table um it's just trying to outsmart a really wily old doe and it's challenging um so I, I think there, I think there needs to be a little bit more emphasis on the reward and being successful and in, in taking an older deer, not just an older buck, but an older doe, because that's uh, it's a challenge, and that should be 
that should be highlighted and, and complimented if someone's able to do that, especially with a, a, a shorter range equipment like a, like a trad bow or even a compound bow. Absolutely. Do you happen to know what the, uh, what, what's like a real good body weight for a mature doe here in our state? I, I guess that's different for the southern region to the northern Michigan. But, you know, if somebody puts a, puts a doe up on a scale, like what's a weight where they would look at and go, wow, like that's impressive. Yeah, so obviously it's going to vary from north to south. Um, there's a lot of difference there. Um, and uh, probably from uh, if you're talking just field dressed weight, um, if you can get an animal that's in that 120, 130 pound range, that's pretty impressive. That's probably a, a 160 pound, 165 pound doe live weight. And that's a really good old big doe. Um, if you can do that, that's a that's a trophy animal right there. Absolutely. And certainly there will probably be animals that can go bigger than that. And certainly you can shoot really nice deer and old mature deer, uh, smaller than that. But, um, if you can get in that range, you're doing something special. That's cool. I'm going to be conscious of that this year. You know, I started listening to a podcast called the, the big woods buck podcast. And it's uh, some gentlemen out of Maine that are big deer hunters and they're they're trackers, so they they track on big tracks and mature deer, and they're not concerned as, with antlers as much as they are as body weight. They classify deer as a 200 pounder as like a, a trophy up there in Maine, and that started hitting home with me, you know, because uh, it'd be something that I'm paying a little more attention to this year. I know I was negligent last year, and neither one of my bucks did I put up on a scale and and way but uh this year uh, i'm going to be paying a little more closer attention to that and now hearing those numbers from you i'm definitely going to be interested to see what uh what i can put up on the i guess i'll call it the dough pole here in the garage uh for body weight on a big mature dough because i got a couple on camera that are they look big yeah well, that's that's that would be good luck. That would be a good one to get. Um, like I said, if you can get close range with that, um, just outsmarting those, those old girls is, is sometimes, uh, as much fun or just as exciting as getting in close to a, a younger buck, which might be a little bit more naive. So I think it takes a lot of skill to get that. And, uh, like I said, I think that's something that should be, should be highlighted and celebrated if you can, if you can be successful with them. Uh, one last thing that I want to bring up and then I'm going to just kind of ask you, you know, to maybe wrap this thing up, anything that I missed. Um, I've heard guys ask, um, and bring up the fact that it can be somewhat difficult logistically to get deer tested. Um, where, is there going to be maybe, uh, a little more access to facilities where people can go to get testing? I mean, are we going to have a little more manpower on that front this year or, or is, are we going to be kind of in the same situation that we were in years past? No, we've, we've obviously highlighted that as a, as an important issue going into this year. Um, so traditionally what we've done is we've just established check stations and we operate those check stations. Um, if you're outside of the CWD zone, um, sometimes it's just a, a couple weeks out of the year, um, might be only a couple days within those couple weeks that are, that are, they're open. Within our CWD zone, we've operated them usually seven days a week, but they still close, right? You know, if you're out tracking a deer and you get home and you finally get it and you get in late and you want to get checked, the check stations close. Um, and that throws off the next couple of days in terms of getting that animal in and tested. And it, it can be a real inconvenience. Um, given the size and scale from our surveillance this year, we knew we had to change our approach. Um, so we still are bringing on a, a workforce. So we, we going through hiring, I think it's 60 seasonal workers to help work with check stations this year. But we're, we're redistributing how they're working this year. So we're still having our traditional check stations. But some of those individuals will be responsible for collecting deer and deer heads from uh, a voluntary drop box. So we're making it a little bit more customer friendly and self-service where if you don't want to go to a check station or if you're getting in late or if a check station's closed, we're going to have these self-service drop boxes where you can bring the deer in um, whack its head off. It's really convenient. Obviously, if it's a doe, fill out the tag where you shot it and just drop it in the box. And we'll we'll have this staff go out, go around, pick it up, and we'll have it all tested for you and get those results back to you um, online. 
So that's a, that's a new wrinkle that we're going to try this year. Um, we're also working with taxidermists, um, especially if you get a really nice buck. You don't want to cut the head off. You don't want to damage the mount. You want to do a nice shoulder mount. Uh, we're going to work with taxidermists and have them trained to get that animal tested. So you're, you're not going to find anybody better uh, with a knife in terms of keeping things out and understanding the anatomy of the deer. So we're working with a taxidermist, pull, having them trained to pull out those lymph nodes and submit them. Um, so there'll be options there. And then we're going to try to work with some processors too. Um, try to work with them either in terms of having drop boxes there or having staff there available. So as the deer come in, we're there waiting for you and talking with you and see if you want to submit the animal for testing. So it's going to be a lot more of we're going to come to you rather than have you come to us. And we just feel that that's a, a better a better approach going forward, especially given the area that we're covering. Sure. We need to be smart. We need to be smarter with our, our tactics. Okay. Well, great. In closing, what did I miss? Is there anything you want to cover? Um, kind of give you the stage here for the in closing part of this. And uh, what did I miss? Anything that you want to say before we wrap this up? Um, from the regulation side, I think there's maybe two little pieces we didn't quite discuss. Um, one is sort of we're, we're shifting over the, our, our traditional muzzleloader season to a second firearm season. Um, again, reason we did that is we know tacking on days on the front end or the back end isn't going to move the needle very much. Um, and we also noticed by looking at some of the trends that muzzleloader season is really starting to decline in participation. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Statewide, over the past 10 years, we've lost 25% of our hunters out of the muzzleloader season. That's crazy. So, That's like my favorite part of the season. Yeah, we've gone from about 200,000 participants to about 100,000 or 150,000. I'm sorry. Um, so about, and this is in a really short time frame, just 10 years. So we're losing a lot. Um, I think what's happening is people have sort of migrated into that archery season um, where our numbers are holding pretty steady um, for the past about 15 to 20 years. Um, we've been really steady in terms of the number of hunters we keep in our archery season. And that makes sense as you get an older sort of aging hunter populace. Um, yeah. They have a little bit more time available to them. Maybe they enjoy going out in the, in the uh, early fall a little bit more than going out into the right. cold, cold of <laughs> the muzzleloader below. season. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, think, I think probably allowing the crossbow opportunity and expanding that years ago has probably helped that uh, maintain that uh, retention a little bit in archery season. And then we've also got some, some different equipment on the landscape too. So, you know, I think guys are out shooting their, their straight walled cartridge um, guns, um, you know, in the, in the, in that lower uh, no rifle zone. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's some additional opportunities there. So we're losing hunters in that season. Um, so we, we we're trying to keep people going. Um, so we added uh, that that firearm opportunities in that season. And again, I'm not sure if too many states that have done that. We'll see if that turns out to be a a change that has merit, or if it's just uh, really not changing a whole lot of anything. So that'll be interesting to see how that transpires. And then there's some carcass movement restrictions as well, and it's really complicated. Basically, in a five county core. You can't move an animal outside that five county core if you harvest it unless it's being tested for CWD and you submitted that head for testing or you basically are keeping the brain and the spinal column in that area. So um, then there's and there's three different tiers. There's the core area. There's the remainder part of the CWD management zone. And then there's the rest of the state. And you can bring deer closer to the core all you want. So you can take a deer from the UP to your processor right in Montcalm County, no problem. But you can't take a deer from Montcalm County and go up to the UP. You have to take those precautions first. Um, so that's, uh, we're going to try to do a little bit better job with educating what that means because <laughs> um, that's a sort of a complicated approach that uh, was recently adopted. Okay. So th those are two of the bigger changes. I don't think we discussed a whole lot, but uh, you know, if I if you're giving me like a couple last sentences, I guess what I would say is um, 
there's a lot of really good information out there on the CWD front. Um, and there's a lot of really confusing and misleading information as well. And I think context really matters. So there's a lot of words that are being used in statements that are very carefully chosen. So understand what those words mean um, and understand and try to unwrap exactly why those words were chosen. Um, and don't be afraid to dive into those issues a little bit more um, and try to understand what the uh, true intent of some of that messaging is. What's one of uh, maybe your preferred or the better resources that uh, people can find some good, solid, uh, you know, information on CWD if they want to uh, read, read, read more or hear more? Yeah, so um, I think we talked about it right at the beginning. There's there's been a lot of information, some podcasts even out there um, that have been really good. Um, I think a lot of the information um, that comes through what's called the CWD Alliance. And I think the website is like cwd-info.org, I believe. Um, they have some really good information there. Um, they try to really update the website um, and, and try to keep a very balanced approach. Um, and then the U.S. Geological Survey um, does a really good job as well. And, uh, you know, there was... Uh, an individual on a highly public podcast not too long ago. And quite frankly, I think he's probably one of the best and most fair representatives in terms of communicating what CWD and the impacts are, um, trying to weed out the extremes. So I think he does a really good job of finding the middle ground and sticking to the science. So um, certainly I'd encourage anybody to listen to, to that podcast with uh if there's any interest in learning more about cwd which one was that that was the uh the joe rogan experience uh podcast with uh oh yeah right his, his name's mr mr brian richards right um he does a fantastic job in communicating what uh cwd is uh i uh i, I think found. he's yeah he's he's uh i can i can speak in the circles that that i run in with a lot of other biologists and researchers he's highly respected in his approach um so if you're looking for an authority to listen to he's a good one that was an excellent podcast and i know just from watching my social media feeds that a lot of guys that tune into this show week in and week out listen to that podcast and really enjoyed it really enjoyed it too so yeah um i'm glad you brought that up so thank you so much yeah. chad i i I really appreciate you coming on here and doing that. Was there anything else that we missed or that you, maybe the last thing you want to cover here? I don't want to take up your whole evening. No, no worries. Um, we've got, we've got a really good website. We're going to try to be updating this information throughout the, uh, throughout the hunting season. But if, if anybody's interested in the status of CWD in Michigan and what we're doing and what we're, what we're seeing as the, the deer hunting season progresses, um, I'd encourage you to go to our website. It's pretty easy. It's just mi.gov slash CWD. And uh, we put a lot of information and content up there. We've also got some links to uh, some really good videos on our YouTube channel where we brought in a bunch of experts from around the country to talk at a CWD symposium last October. Um, so there's some some opportunities to further increase your knowledge on the topic by, by listening to some of those experts. Well, I'd like to say uh, if you see or know of anyone that's responsible personally, give them my congratulations on doing a great job on overhauling the uh, DNR website and making it uh, a lot more smartphone friendly uh, than it was in the past. They they did a great job with it and uh, uh, an important thing uh, nowadays because that's where, where everybody's going to and that's what everybody's reaching for is their phone to get on there and buy tag i mean i did my antlerless tag uh application right through my smartphone and it was it was effortless so i, I greatly appreciate that yeah I'll, I'll pass that uh appreciation on it was uh it was sorely outdated and uh, i agree i think they did a a pretty good job of updating it so i'm sure they'll be happy to see that it's, it's nice to get positive feedback well, thank you so much, Chad. I appreciate you taking time to do this this evening. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again, hopefully sooner than 
later and uh if i don't talk to you before it begins uh, i wish you the best of luck uh this year during your deer season and i hope you get some time off to get out there and get in the woods yeah no thank you uh i'll be uh tracking your uh approach this year as well i know you got some exciting stuff coming up and uh I wish you uh, continued success in the podcast world. I know uh, it's uh, we talked a little bit, and it's it's doing really well for you, and I hope that keeps going. So yeah. good luck to you, man. Thank you, Chad.